All right. Thank you, everybody, for coming to the Ask the EFF panel. It's so great to see so many people here filling up this room. Um, we are the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, thank you. And it's always a pleasure to come here to DEF CON. There are so many people who have been uh, great supporters of us here and so many people who are doing interesting things that lead to interesting issues, trying to uh, help make the world a better place. And we really also enjoy helping defend the people in this community. You know, no arrests so far and we're going to hope that for the rest of the weekend. Um, so I'm Kurt Opsahl. Uh, I'm one of the attorneys at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, I do work on the Coders' Rights Project, uh, which is designed to try and make sure people understand what their legal risks are when doing security research and talking about it. Uh, I also work on some of our other uh, stuff, but what I'll be talking about a bit is uh, the NSA surveillance and some of the, the recent revelations and what EFF is doing about it. What we're going to do is we're going to go down the line here uh, where each of us will talk a little bit about some of the projects that we're, uh, we're doing and introduce themselves. Uh, and then after we uh, have that sort of brief introduction, uh, we're going to turn it over to you to, to bring up your questions. Uh, there is a microphone over on this side. Uh, so if you have questions, you can just line up uh, in front of that microphone. Uh, and ask them. Uh, a couple of things I want to say uh, about the kind of questions. Uh, you know, we're happy to talk about a lot of the legal and policy issues that we do in our technology project and such, but this is not the forum to ask for legal advice. Uh, if you, we do provide legal advice to people, but that is something that is best done in a confidential setting. And this is not only not confidential because of all you fine people who are here, it's also being recorded uh, for posterity. So it's really not the right place for asking, uh, you know, here I did this thing last night. Was that legal? Um, <laughs> All right, so let me, let me just uh, begin uh, with just uh, uh, one of the things that uh, EFF is working on that I've been part of uh, and that is about uh, the NSA uh, warrantless surveillance program. It's been a little bit in the news lately. Some of you may have read about it. Um, and uh, we've actually been working on these issues for quite a long time. In 2005, the New York Times uh, published some reports about a warrantless surveillance program um, that uh, uh, was rebranded uh, by the Bush administration as the terrorist surveillance program or at least part of that. Uh, the following year the USA Today published some reports about a uh, program to get the call detail records from various telecommunication companies. Uh, and we have uh, actually from from based on the information that we learned at that time, a case that we brought uh, uh, representing some people against the uh, NSA and the, and the government to try and stop the surveillance and that was called Jewel versus NSA and that has been going on in the courts for, for years now. Uh, but we have recently had a little bit of, of good news there which I'll get to in a, uh, in a second but I also want to say there was a second case that um, was uh, brought about uh, last month and that was first Unitarian versus US NSA. So in the Jewel case, uh, the, the government put forward uh, the state secret privilege. It said, hey, this has got some secrets to it uh, that prevent it from being uh, litigated uh, and so uh, we, we can't allow this, this case to go forward. And they brought up a, a number of other uh, uh, defenses. And what we have said is that uh, under the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, there is a procedure set out by Congress uh, after uh, the Church Commission found a whole bunch of misuse of surveillance powers to determine the legality. To have a court rule about whether what it is that they're doing is or is not legal. And that's the procedure that trumps the state secret privilege. Um, so this case has gone uh, up and down in the courts. It went, uh, um, we uh, lost an initial round, went up to the appeals court, we won the appeal, went back down to the district court and then last month the district court said the case can go forward, we can go uh, uh, through this under the, um, under the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act and so that case is ongoing. Uh, we're going to see whether the next move from the government is to appeal that or, or to move forward uh, in the district court. 
Um, after some of the uh, more uh, recent revelations that have uh, uh, confirmed a lot of the stuff that we had seen before, but provided something special. I mean, I assume that most people here have been paying a fair amount of attention to uh, some of the stuff that's come out in the Guardian. Uh, one of the things that came out was a copy of an order that was for Verizon to hand over all of the records. Um, and this was the call detail record. These are who you called, how long you spoke, um, and sort of the time of, of the call. And it was for all of them, not just uh, you know one end foreign, not not uh, not purely foreign, but also all the way down to local calls. And on a daily basis, they were to turn over to uh, the FBI to hand over to the NSA, or direct, more or less directly to the NSA, uh, this database of the previous day's calls, and then it would be added into the pool for uh, analysis of contact chains. Basically, this is a kind of take, taking the metadata. Now, they, the government will say, oh, it's just metadata. It's not a big deal. Uh, but metadata is a big deal. It, it shows who you call um, and that can reveal a tremendous amount about your relationship. It can be a tremendous amount about you. If you're, you know, uh, all of a sudden uh, you're, you're calling and making a lot of calls to a doctor that says something about your health situation. If you are calling, uh, you know, certain representatives uh, or uh, political groups, it may say something about your political affiliation. There's a lot that it says about you that doesn't require them to listen to the content of the call. Um, so this is very important information. It's very sensitive. The new case that we filed last month, First Unitarian versus the NSA, was a collection of 18 different uh, political advocacy organizations, church groups, um, people who have a right of association, a right to get together with other people who are like-minded and try and act together. And this comes under the First Amendment, uh, where a lot of the other litigation about uh, the uh, NSA file has been under the Fourth Amendment. Um, because that's exactly what the call detail record program is about, is trying to find out what the associations are. And cases have found um, that indeed that is a First Amendment right. You can organize, get together with like-minded people, try and do collective action without having the government know everybody who you're connecting with. So that case was filed last month. It's just in the beginning phases, but we're moving forward on a new angle. So anyway, that's a very brief summary of some of what we're doing on the litigation front for NSA. And with that, I'll turn it over to Eva. All right. Uh, hi, my name is Eva Gelprin, and I'm a global policy analyst for the uh, Electronic Frontier Foundation. I understand that those are three words that can mean just about anything. Uh, I work on EFF's international team. Uh, there are five of us. Um, EFF is a, is a relatively small organization, and we have a, a reasonably large number of lawyers who specialize in uh, litigation within the United States. But in the meantime, the internet is global and so are we. So it's up to the international team to cover the rest of the world. So that's a little exhausting. And in some of these places, uh, rule of law is relatively strong, and so we can uh, we can pursue our protection of the internet through policy venues. Uh, we can we can fight bad laws. We can go to the European Parliament. We can fight uh, you know secret uh, trade uh, treaties like TPP and ACTA in in this sort of policy space. Um, but a lot of my favorite work happens in uh, in countries or working with people who are located in places where the the rule of law is even less strong than it is in the United States. And you really cannot uh, pursue our, the goal of, uh, of internet freedom through policy venues. And instead you have to go through this sort of you know, process of uh, helping users to protect themselves, uh, often using technical tools. So I spend a lot of time talking to uh, journalists, uh, especially independent journalism, uh, journalists uh, in countries where the mere act of independent journalism is almost indistinguishable from activism. Uh, simply having your opinion and uh, and publishing it about uh, about the news is uh, is an act of activism in many countries. Uh, so I talk to a lot of terrified journalists, and I talk to a lot of uh, terrified uh, activists 
uh, sometimes difficult to tell the difference. Uh, and I spent a lot of time advising them on best practices for, uh, for protecting their security and privacy and talking about sort of their rights as they, uh, as they travel around and try to publish the information that they have. Uh, so in a lot of ways, I rely on you guys. Um, because the, the only way to really understand best practices is to understand what the threats are on the internet right now and what kind of threat models people are looking at uh, and uh, what both governments and individuals are capable of doing when it comes to compromising people's uh, privacy and security. So uh, I follow the hacker community very, very closely. Uh, this is my seventh DEF CON, uh, not in a row. I think the first one that I ever attended was in 1998. Uh, it was a much smaller room. So uh, one of the things that I wanted to talk about really quick uh, was uh, while most of the people here are going to be talking about what they can do for you, I'm going to talk a little bit about what you can do for me. Uh, the biggest project that I was working on last year was uh, the uh, project in which we were uh, finding, documenting, reverse engineering and then writing up um, the reports on Syrian malware which uh, pro-Syrian government forces, forces uh, sympathetic to uh, President Assad uh, were deploying to spy on activists throughout Syria. The idea being that even if you're using, um, even if you're using encryption, that they would uh, install uh, surreptitiously install root, a rootkit on your machine, therefore uh, bypassing all of your precious, precious encryption and all of the good advice that I could possibly give to Syrian activists. So we spent a lot of time tracking down this malware, reverse engineering it, and uh, writing up reports. We had those reports translated into Arabic because there's no point in writing them if they can't be read by the people who are being targeted, uh, and. And um, this, uh, this was actually very successful. And as a result, I have uh, terrified activists coming to me with more malware from all over the world, from places like Ethiopia and Vietnam and occasionally China. There are a lot of people who reverse Chinese malware. Um, and so what I really need from you, show of hands, who here reverses malware? Anybody? Anybody? I see some hands. Some I need you all. And over here. Uh, yeah. So I need you all uh, to come talk to me after this talk uh, because I have, uh, I have more terrifying malware than I have reversers and uh, this is where I go to pick up more reversers. <laughs> so I desperately need your help. Uh, I am here to answer questions about anything involving the rest of the world. Including Julian Assange, I can talk a little bit about Julian we'll Assange. Do the and then at the, at we'll the get there. Uh, so yeah, Julian Assange, Edward Snowden, ACTA, TPP, China, uh, Iran, uh, all kinds of terrible malware, Gamma, Finn Fisher, U.S. companies selling to authoritarian regimes in Turkmenistan. Uh, so that's what I do. And if you have questions about that, I'll be happy to answer them later. Hi there. Um, my name is Marsha Hoffman. I um, was a senior staff attorney at the Electronic Frontier Foundation uh, for a long time. I was there for seven years and I left just a couple months ago to start my own little private practice focused on technology law, um, very specifically privacy issues, copyright issues, hacking and security related things, free speech. And um, I remain involved with EFF as a fellow and so that's why I'm here on this panel today because I'm still an EFF fellow. And um, I um, also became an EFF member last night for the sole selfish purpose of getting the, the totally amazing rockin' EFF DEF CON t-shirt. I don't know if you've seen the new one but you should visit the booth and check it out. It's really amazing and fantastic. I love it. Um, so I wanted to talk to you today about a case that I became involved in while I was still at EFF uh, but when I left I remained involved in it and EFF is also involved in it so we're partnering on it. Um, this is a case some of you may have heard about. It's called United States versus Auernheimer. Does ‑‑ how many ‑‑ just show of hands, how many people have heard of this? Okay. You may also know it as the Weave case or the iPad hacker case. Does that ring any bells? So let me tell you what happened in this case. There's this guy named Daniel Spiller and um, he notices something interesting about iPads a few years ago. Um, specifically what he notices is that if a person has an iPad and wants to go set up a data plan on that iPad, then the person um, goes and visits the AT&T website. 
using the browser on the iPad. And um, when they visit the browser, um, they see a pop-up window that has pre-populated in the pop-up window uh, the, the account holder's email address. And then the account holder is supposed to type in the password to get into the account. And he notices that when you see this pop-up window in the browser, in the URL, um, there is a, a number. And he recognizes that this is um, an ICC ID, which is a unique identifier associated with the SIM card of the iPad. So basically what was happening was the, the AT&T servers uh, were recognizing that this is this particular iPad. Uh, AT&T knows that this is this, um, this iPad is associated with this account holder. So then they pre-populate the email address. And he says, oh, well, I wonder what happens if I change that number. What if I change one digit? And boom, there's a different email address. And so he wrote a script um, that basically just iterated through the ICC IDs in the URL and um, managed to harvest uh, about 140,000 email addresses this way. And then um, he, uh, in, while he's in the process of doing this, he, he goes online and he tells um, some of his friends there, um, oh my God, I just figured out that AT&T does this thing and I wrote this script and I'm harvesting this stuff. And um, one of the people that he was speaking to about this is this guy named Andrew Arnheimer who's also known as Weave. Um, Weave says, well, we should see if in that list of email addresses there are any reporters and we could tell them about this and maybe they'll write about it. So they identify several reporters including a Gawker reporter and um, Weave sends them an email and explains the situation, um, frankly in rather provocative terms um, to attract attention. And then uh, Gawker published a story about it. And um, both Spitler and Weave uh, were then indicted um, on uh, two felony counts each, uh, conspiracy to violate the Federal Computer Fraud and Abuse Act and identity theft. Um, so basically the government's argument um, for the, the violation, the conspiracy to violate the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act was that Spitler's, um, the, Spitler's script, his access to AT&T's servers um, amounted to unauthorized access to protected computers. Um, and I think that this is a really uh, concerning interpretation of the law because this is information that uh, AT&T published on the internet. Um, it was hidden uh, but there was no barrier in place to protect that information. There was no password. There was nothing. They ba AT and T basically just hoped that people would never notice it was there. Um, and uh, so what ended up happening was um, Spitler cooperated with the government, um, testified against Weave um, and in November uh, Weave was convicted uh, on two felony counts, sentenced to three and a half years in prison in order to pay AT&T $73,000 to compensate them for um, what they needed to do to, to rectify the situation. And um, we are in the midst of appealing this case. Um, uh, EFF is, is on it. I'm continuing to work on it pro bono. Uh, we're joined by Oren Kerr who's a, a very well known and respected computer crime professor. <coughs> And um, Weave's trial counsel, Tor Eklund and Mark Jaffe, and uh, we're partnering to appeal this to the Third Circuit uh, Court of Appeals. We filed our opening brief in July, uh, July 1st, and um, the government's uh, uh, opposition will be filed um, in just a couple of weeks. And so uh, that's kind of the deal with that case. And um, if you have questions about it, of course, I'll be happy to discuss or any number of other things that you want to talk about. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mitch Stoltz. I'm an attorney at EFF and the intellectual property team and I apologize in advance for the, the effect of uh, a, a very old kind of malware known as a head cold. So uh, bear with me and I will keep this brief. Um, I work on cases where uh, intellectual property laws like copyright, uh, patent, although I'm less of a patent expert, uh, and some other random laws uh, interfere with freedom of speech. Uh, freedom to build, freedom to tinker. And I'll just quickly mention two things that are, you know, probably, you know, really current issues and probably of interest to, to some of the people here. Um, one is the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. 
Um, this was a law passed 15 years ago. Um, and part of it is a, a, a federal civil and criminal ban on breaking um, what's commonly known as DRM, so digital uh, uh, access controls on copyrighted works. Um, this, for the, to the, for the start, we think was a bad premise because with a few generally not that useful exceptions, it is illegal to break DRM even if you are breaking it for an otherwise legal purpose. Now there are some exceptions, but those exceptions are hard to use uh, for, for the most part. They protect certain people uh, and not others and the, there is a process where the Library of Congress can pass new exceptions every three years. The problem with those is they're generally very narrow and they only last three years. Now what happened this year, a um, couple of things that were interesting in the last three year cycle, which was uh, 2009 to 2009, beginning in 2009, uh, uh, EFF asked for and got a uh, exemption for um, jailbreaking smartphones. Um, a declaration, a shield against lawsuits for people who want to install unapproved apps on a uh, mobile phone device. Um, and at the time there was the, another group, uh, actually this was EFF at the time, uh, also got a, an exemption for, for unlocking, that is for modifying a smartphone to use it on a different uh, wireless network, uh, 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 different, different cellular network. Um, what happened this year, we uh, successfully renewed the exemption, for, uh, sorry, in 2012, we successfully renewed the exemption for jailbreaking but the Library of Congress decided not to renew the exemption for unlocking. This was really strange to a lot of people. Um, and the way it was reported in the press, mostly accurately, was the, the Librarian of Congress says that unlocking your phone to switch carriers is now illegal. Maybe not true exactly. A couple of courts have gone one way, a couple of courts have gone the other way. There is no connection to protecting copyrighted works here which was arguably what this law was supposed to do. But the, some of the major cellular networks, the cellular carriers uh, have claimed and continue to claim that if you unlock your phone or if you hire someone to unlock your phone without uh, their permission, uh, that they can sue you uh, and that there may even be criminal penalties. This is separate and apart from your contract. Uh, Obviously, you, you break a contract, usually you have to pay an early termination penalty. This is something everybody understands. It's a bargain that you make when you sign up for a uh, mobile phone service. This is on top of that. Uh, the claim that because of this law that was supposed to protect uh, and restrict, for example, the encryption on DVDs, because of that law, uh, you can't uh, change carriers without the your current carrier's permission all really fairly ridiculous. Um, now there's a bill going through Congress, um, just uh, passed out of a House committee la uh, last week that f uh, would fix in a very narrow way this very specific problem about phone unlocking, but only for the next two years and without getting at the deeper problem, which is that this law is used as a club to uh, stop and to punish um, lots of things that could be called circumventing a, a digital access control. Um, going beyond just protection of uh, copyrighted uh, material, movies, music and so on, books, um, to, to really being yet another kind of anti-hacking law that it gets uh, used, as a, used as a club. Um, you know, we, you know, we're looking for, you know, looking for ways to get, to hopefully get Congress to fix this law in a, in a more really comprehensive way. But in the meantime, um, we continue to ask the Library of Congress for exemptions. 
and uh, we're interested in hearing people's stories about um, how they, you know, and what circumstances do you need to um, circumvent or undo or, or, or avoid um, digital access controls and, in what, uh, and uh, if you've ever been, been legally threatened for those things. Those are um, things that we'd be interested to hear about, you know, in private and confidentially. Um, or, if you have it, or if you have thoughts about that law. Uh, and the other, the other area that I'll mention real, real briefly is patent trolls, which has been a really big area for us this year and for, the, and for the country. We've seen really strong statements out of the White House, out of a lot of sectors of the digital and technology economies about patent trolls. Now, what are patent trolls? There's not a really uh, widely accepted definition, but generally speaking, we're talking about companies that don't build or produce or sell things. They simply own patents. Excuse me. And <coughs> they simply own patents and sue over them. Um, the really damaging ones are in the information technology space and in the, in the internet space. So, for example, recently there's a company that has been threatening bloggers <coughs> with patent infringement lawsuits because they claim to own a patent that covers some really basic aspects of web publishing, things that have really have been done for over a decade. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, was the uh, other one recently? It'll come to me. Um, th there's a, a number of things that are being done. And there's a number of things that EFF is doing now. We just launched a site called TrollingEffects.org where we're trying to collect the legal threat letters that people have received. Um, from patent trolls or, or likely patent trolls, see if we can develop a picture of who is doing this, what patents do they actually own. It's, it's hard to tell who owns what because they tend to use shell companies and, if you will, false identities when they send these demand letters. But if we can get a, if, we, if people send them to us, we, uh, to trollingfects.org, we will be able to uh, hopefully get a picture of who's doing what and um, it can be a resource for people who, who get a threat letter to, to figure out you know, how legitimate it is, what's, whether this is a company that's likely to actually sue, so on and so forth. Um, so again, we'd be uh, interested to hear from you um, how patents on software, patents on protocols, patents on, on communications technologies, et cetera, um, have, have affected you. Uh, and I'll leave it at that. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Dan Auerbach. I'm a staff technologist at EFF. We have a team of four technologists. Uh, and part of my job is to provide uh, technical support for the organization in terms of if someone wants to know what's an IP address or how does network address translation work or these sorts of questions, I, I give that uh, information to our uh, legal team and activism team and to uh, journalists. Um, but today I wanted to give an overview of the other aspect of what, what we work on, which is we have a, a bunch of tech projects. Um, a kind of theme of our tech projects uh, is encrypting the web. So this is kind of a, a mission that we have at EFF to try to encourage the adoption of HTTPS and the use of HTTPS as much as possible. Um, and we've been encouraged with recent news uh, based on the, the leaks, uh, the NSA leaks, that uh, encryption does seem to work. The NSA doesn't have some sort of magic ability to decrypt things, um, which is great news. And it means that we really need to deprecate HTTP. We need HTTP to become like Telnet um, uh, to what SSH is now. And so uh, towards that end, we have a project that we launched in uh, 2010 which is called HTTPS Everywhere. It's a browser extension for Chrome and Firefox. This is probably our most visible project. And the way this works is there's just a, a giant list of rules um, and your browser understands that some websites offer an HTTPS connection but don't do it by default. And so HTTPS Everywhere uh, 
encrypts those connections. It, it, it recognizes, hey, this is a website like Wikipedia until today, I believe, um, which by default was over HTTP, um, but uh, with our add-on, it would encrypt that traffic. So that was kind of our first foray into this uh, area. But then we started noticing, well, HTTPS is great, but uh, PKI, public key infrastructure, the, the certificate authority system is really seems really problematic. And so what we did next was uh, this project called the observatory where we did a scan on port 443 of the entire IPv4 internet and we collected all the security certificates. Um, and with that we made a map of uh, the existing certificate authorities and the relationships between them. So some certificate authorities are, are root and they're, they're trusted in your browser. Others are intermediate. Some uh, certificates can be cached by the browser even though they're not explicitly trusted. So it's kind of this uh, messy world of how certificates are, are handled. And uh, for people who kind of follow this issue, it's well known that PKI is, is pretty broken, that we need to fix it. Um, but the observatory was kind of a tool that we tried to, to use to study this problem. We also have something called the decentralized SSL observatory which for HTTPS users on Firefox you can opt in to sending us the certificates that you see as you browse around the web. Um, and so this is a, a way for us to detect attacks. So for example if your browser thinks that the, it's, it's seeing a valid certificate for uh, google.com but we notice, whoa, this is very different than a lot of the other certificates we're seeing. Um, we'll be able to, to warn the user about that. And we also will be able to kind of get some uh, more information about uh, the, 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 how certificates uh, vary from region to region and how uh, web servers generally deploy their SSL certificates. Um, so that's kind of some of our projects in the vein of encrypting the web. Uh, but we also have other stuff we work on too. So another area that we've been uh, kind of investigating lately is the issue of non-consensual tracking on the web. So ten years ago when you visited a site like the New York Times, your browser loaded resources mostly just from the New York Times. Now if you uh, inspect, uh, when you load the New York Times and you, uh, you know, open uh, uh, a debugger to see all the resources you're loading. It's from m maybe dozens or hundreds of different companies, many of which are uh, kind of thir invisible third party trackers which are amassing browsing histories of users. So we think this is really bad. People don't know about it and it's happening more and more. Um, there is an effort called Do Not Track which was supposed to help mitigate this problem. But unfortunately the W3C um, tracking protection working group which I'm on has stalled quite a bit. Um, and so users are left with a few different options. They can install an ad blocker which uh, I'm sure many of the savvier people in this room have already done. Um, but advertising does form a significant portion of revenue on the web and we don't think that you should have to, to block all ads in order to, to stop tracking. Um, so what we did is we are building a tool which is actually an experimental uh, Chrome extension which you can download now. It's called the EFF Tracker Blocking Laboratory. And so what we thought we would do is add to the ecosystem of uh, blockers by instead of having a list based blocker, like most blockers today if you use Adblock Plus or Disconnect or Ghostery, there's kind of a manually curated list and a central crawl. What we're doing instead is uh, it's a heuristic based blocker. So we from within the browser as you browse around we notice hmm this domain seems like it's tracking you and we block it based on that. This is very experimental but this is a direction we're going to try to add to the ecosystem so, uh, so that we can hopefully eventually land a feature like this in browsers so that we can start to fight back more against this non-consensual tracking. Um, and then finally we have uh, a project to promote open wireless access. So we are trying to make it easier for people to um, uh, provide open wireless guest access 
uh, with a deprioritized, uh, sorry, with a second uh, wireless LAN that's deprioritized so that your bandwidth isn't affected. Um, and we're trying to think about how to build security properties into that open uh, wireless uh, solution. It, it's actually the case that it, WPA2 doesn't provide much security, especially at a conference like this. It's essentially an open network because everyone has the password. So we're looking at ways to get WPA2 kind of equivalent security for open networks. So that's just a little overview of some of our tech projects and if you have any questions about any of those, uh, I'm the guy to ask. Thank you. Hi everyone. I'm Mark Jaycox. I'm a legislative assistant for EFF, uh, working for the legal and activism teams. Um, and that involves working with, uh, dealing with Congress and legislation and also blogging, helping out run coalitions and things like that. Um, I'm going to give probably just a quick overview of my year uh, with what we've been doing and what we've been working on. And so the year kind of started off with the CISPA, um, which is the Cyber Intelligence Sharing and Protection Act. And before the leaks, it was, this was a law that granted broad legal immunity for companies to bypass the privacy laws um, and to share a lot more information. Um, so we started off the year with that. Congress year after year has continuously pushed uh, cyber security, um, online, really online security, network security bills. Um, and all cyber talk has taken over Washington DC. Um, they often, at least the language they offer is not, you know, very technical. The terms are always pretty bad. Um, and so we started off this year with the House debating this issue and uh, kind of arguing for these massive exemptions. Um, and we, over the course of a few months, you know, we had a very large campaign uh, to combat this bill. Um, and it was one of many bills that comes back every year. Um, and so it was, this was in the House. Uh, we created a, you know, a CISPA is back campaign. It's kind of the zombie, zombie bill that comes back. Last year uh, we had defeated it. This year in the House it had passed. Um, but we ran a pretty successful campaign with numbers we hadn't seen since the SOPA campaign. We had, you know, over 100,000 signatures uh, against this bill and a, a very good show out of congressmen coming, coming out against this bill. Um, and it was such a good showing that, and we were able to do such a good job uh, with the help of the community that the Senate, you know, saw the bill, looked at a lot of our critiques and agreed with the massive privacy invasion that the bill had. Um, they also agreed that it wasn't the right way to really deal with online security or network security when it comes uh, in the federal government and private companies. Um, and so the year kind of started out with that. Um, Fortunately, they have kind of stopped pushing that, uh, these types of bills so far we'll see with the recent leaks. Um, and it segued, we moved on and segued into uh, CFAA reform, so the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Um, and for the past, you know, from probably January until June, um, EFF uh, uh, along with Stanford and CDT and Demand Progress has been pushing for CFAA reform, um, especially in light of Aaron. Um, and it was a really big issue and it was, it is really important to us. It's important to the community. And so we have this coalition, a pretty broad left to right coalition. And we spent, you know, many months, uh, putting the pressure on Congress, creating a campaign from a wide and diverse set of individuals to change the computer fraud and abuse act, to decrease the penalties in it, to clarify the law so that it can't, it, can't be abused and it's much harder to be abused by the Department of Justice and by companies. Um, and to make sure that it's actually used for its uh, original intent. Right now, CFAA on the civil side uh, tends to be used a lot more for trade secrets than for protecting against hacking and that shouldn't be the case. Um, and so after many months, uh, in the, about a few weeks ago actually, four weeks ago, three, four weeks ago, so Lofgren, Jim Sensenbrenner, um, and Senator Wyden introduced Aaron's law. Um, and so this is a law that decreases some of the penalties, um, doesn't allow the government to bootstrap uh, ex uh, multiple penalties to jump up the prison time um, and clarifies 
and incorporates the two better judicial decisions that are out there in the Ninth and Fourth Circuits. Um, and so right now we have, this is one of our major campaigns that's going on, and uh, we actually have a phone booth in, that we brought that's in the contest area that is a direct line to Congress, so you can call up the congressional switchboard, ask for your rep, and uh, give them your mind and speak to them about it. Because if anything, I mean, especially with these bills every year and kind of how DC is, has been for a while, but it's, it's starting, starting to get right in our faces that it's, it's time for the community to really push back. Um, and it's time for the community to engage with them and tell them what's up. Um, and so that's, pro that's one of our bigger campaigns. We have this, it's a pretty cool 80s phone booth uh, that we have. Um, and so yeah, I encourage you to go to the contest area and check it out. Um, we also have a, another thing that uh, is part of CFA reform is uh, the security researcher's letter and uh, letter to Congress from the community, from DEF CON uh, B-sides also. And the letter uh, demands Congress to take up CFA reform, which increasingly looks like a possibility and, and that they're going to do. Um, do it and move it. Um, and it's a letter from the community and from security researchers pretty much uh, pushing for Aaron's law and pushing for uh, CFAA reform. Um, and so that's kind of our, what's been going on with CFAA reform. And uh, you know, it does look like that they are listening. Um, and the campaigns have been pretty fantastic so far and the response to the community has been fantastic so far. And it looks like they will pick it up. They're going to discuss it. There will be hearings on it and we'll see where it goes. I mean, it's something that EFF is going to continue to push for and so is demand progress both in the courts and in front of Congress. Um, and then coming off of that, uh, obviously what happened next, right? So that was probably right until June, mid-June. Uh, and what happened next was the NSA spying leaks. Um, and focused around that, we just have had, uh, there are over, you know, 10 bills to fix this. Uh, we had uh, overnight campaigns launching, especially with the, the most recent, the first time since the leaks that Congress has had to speak out on this, the Amash Amendment, which I don't know um, how many people know about, but um, it was an amendment that would essentially defund and curtail, defund and curtail one part of the spying, the, the use of the Patriot Act um, and the calling information that Kurt was talking about. Um, and so, you know, since the leaks, my pretty much what I've been doing is focusing on the legislation. Um, the legislation deals with a variety of things from fixing Section 215 so that this kind of bulk spying can't happen and doesn't happen to fixing the, the spying is overseen by this secret surveillance court called the uh, Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, the FISA court or FISC for short. FISA court is my preferred term. Um, and some of the bills, you know, half of these 10 bills deal with uh, exposing the legal opinions and the legal rationales that the, just, the government proposes to the secret court and uh, remain top secret. You know, we don't, this is secret law that none of us get to see. Um, it's uh, interpretations of the Fourth Amendment interpretations of the statute that we haven't seen. Um, and so these bills push uh, for the transparency around those opinions um, and also just pure structural reform of the court, making sure the court right now uh, is composed of people selected by uh, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Um, he, nominates, he nominates them and confirms them. Um, and so we have a couple of bills that push for, or we're not pushing for, but the senators uh, have a couple of structural reform bills that were just released this week and we should be blogging about shortly once I get out of here. Um, <laughs> Um, and so that's part of the NSA spying and the most recent thing was the Amash Amendment where the Amash Amendment, this is an amendment again that was going to curtail part of the, part of the Section 215 program, which is a pretty blunt instrument, an amendment to the defense budget bill. And the House, right, has the right, they uh, have the, per, the power of the purse. Um, and so we found out, this was an amendment that we, you know, we had known about for a week or so. Um, it was unclear and the House works, the way the House works is that the leadership decides what amendment gets thrown to the floor. So we didn't really know that this was going to come to the floor. Um, and we found out, you know, about seven o'clock the night before. And overnight we had a pretty aggressive uh, campaign from across the board again. Uh, you know, ACLU, CDT, Demand Progress, um, Free Press, a whole bunch of people, Tech Freedom. Um, and overnight we pretty much created an activism campaign, riled up support, um, a lot of people picked it up, the community reacted brilliantly. 
Um, and we got pr the best vote that we've got uh, since the reauthorization of these laws. Um, and it's a tremendous step forward. It's really a clear signal from Congress that they are, in my opinion, it's a clear signal from Congress that they are very dubious of how Section 215 is being used and they want to change it. Um, and so that's kind of been my first or the first six months of this year. It's been really fun. It's been really intense. Um, and that's kind of what I've been focusing on. All right. Well, now it's time to get your questions asked and, and answered. So anybody who has uh, questions about any of the things we just discussed or other aspects of uh, EFF's work, please come to the, uh, the microphone here um, and we will do our best to, uh, to answer your questions. Uh, the, the FISA court uh, seems to my mind to be a, a secret court as, as a tool of a police state. Uh, what would it, I mean, uh, it, it seems like it probably has a thin justification. And what is the uh, justification? And why can't that court be abolished in total? So the, que the question is, what is the justification for the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court? Uh, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court was created by the uh, Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Um, which, oddly enough, was actually an attempt at reform, which is to say that there was previously no courts that were, were being involved, and so they created the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court in order to have, uh, have judges be involved. So in that sense, it was an attempt to bring some aspects of the judiciary into it. But what has happened is that as a secret court, it is doing secret reinterpretations of the law. And these have gone into some very strange directions. And I'll just give one sort of example of, of where this has gone in some very weird directions. So uh, the, the, the law that, that uh, allows the government, or you know, the government says it allows, uh, to get your phone records is Section 215 of the Patriot Act. Um, and Section 215 says, uh, amongst other things, that it can, you can get business records that are relevant to an authorized investigation. Um, and under that uh, secret interpretation of the law, uh, all of the records of all of the people for all of the time are relevant to an authorized investigation. <laughs> and we haven't seen what that interpretation is, but I, I, I'm really curious to see it because I think it's, it's, it's going to be an amazing piece of BS, right? I mean, how can you make it so that everything is, it means relevant becomes essentially a meaningless word? Uh, there's no difference between that statute with the word relevant and with the, without the word relevant in terms of what you can get. And, you know, interestingly enough, uh, Sensenbrenner, uh, Representative Sensenbrenner, who was actually the author of that section of the Patriot Act, a supporter of the Patriot Act when it passed, he has agreed that that was not what it, what it meant to say. So this is, this is where the problem has to come with the secret FISA well, well, wouldn't that uh, require 310 million search warrants? And, I mean, the Katz case and... Uh, <coughs> That, that can't be legal. Uh, well, I mean, the, uh, without the, a, that, on the Fourth so, Amendment says you need a search warrant for, or 310 million if every. It's true, illegal and unconstitutional are not the same thing, but we think the program is both illegal and unconstitutional. The, <laughs> uh, you talked about. EFF's add-on for uh, blocking tracking cookies. Um, how, do, how does your approach compare to Firefox's approach of blocking third-party cookies by default and then having a cookie clearinghouse to create whitelists and blacklists based on privacy policies? Uh, sure. So ours is, is not a third-party cookie blocking in general. What it, how it works is it's more like an ad blocker. So first of all, it's not just blocking cookies. It actually uh, like black holes resources, um, similar to the way m many ad blockers work today. Uh, so I, if you look at kind of the spectrum, there's blocking uh, based on uh, very general metrics like block all third party cookies. And then there's here's a list of particular resources you should block. And we're trying to kind of find somewhere in the middle um, I mean, we think both of those approaches are valuable, and users should install an ad blocker and they should disable third party cookies in their browser. Um, 
But in addition, we wanted to add to that by having this uh, middle area where it, it's sort of functioning like an ad blocker, except as you browse around, it's dynamically updating the list of resources that should be black holed. So I, I hope that answers the question. Yes, thank okay. you. Hi there. I also wanted to ask about the uh, um, marketing firms, like the private sector marketing firms and the non consensual tracking uh, piece of it. Uh, you, know, you know, you hear a lot of stories about people like browsing for baby stuff and then getting catalogs for maternity wear two weeks later or, um, you know, marketing that can uh, look where your mouse goes and so on. So I guess my question is, is you know, how, how bad are the capabilities of these private sector marketing firms in the first place? And then secondarily, are they being subscribed to by governments in order to turn that anonymous metadata into uniquely identifiable data? Uh, those are great questions and the short answer I think is we don't really know. Um, we don't know too much about uh, whether the government has gone to these firms to, to request data because those requests are secret. Um, some companies are starting to publish transparency reports uh, but these are generally the larger tech companies that have first party presence like uh, Google and, and Facebook and Microsoft and Twitter. Um, but not the invisible third party ad companies that you've never heard of. So we don't really know what data is being requested of them. As far as what abilities they have, um, also it's hard to know. I think there's a lot of data that gets passed around in the background because right now it's the wild west. There's just no rules about what you can do or can't do with user data. Um, so it, it's probably safe to assume that uh, a browsing history associated with a pseudonym is in the hands of many companies uh, if you, uh, the corresponding to you if you're browsing around the web. So that's kind of a half answer but that's the, the closest we get to really knowing. Well, I, I wanted to add on to that. I mean one of the aspects of this are, are data broker companies, uh, commercial companies that collect information from a variety of sources and repackage that and, and make that available for commercial sale. And I think that you should basically rest, rest assured that the government has purchased subscriptions to uh, these, these services. I, I can say that there has been some FOIA work done by the Electronic Privacy Information Center or EPIC that confirms that, um, um, confirmed that several years ago. Okay. Thank you. Hey, I have uh, kind of a two part question about the Computer Assistance for Law Enforcement Act. I don't know if maybe you can, add, okay. Um, yeah, I wrote an article earlier this year pretty foolishly um, which the title inferred that the FBI was planning on uh, surveilling our real-time online communications. Um, that was before <laughs> the NSA uh, revelation. So um, the two-part question I guess is um, one, is Kalia receiving enough um, I guess awareness in the public? Is that still a threat? And um, I know that the that the FBI made some statements several times, one of their previous legal counsels and, and of course later this year about their desire to expand CALEA to allow for real time online surveillance um, as well as extending some of those privileges to local law enforcement. Um, and then the second part of the question is I, concerning jurisdiction if for instance a, legal, uh, a local law enforcement agency had permission to um, uh, do surveillance online. Uh, how, how, I mean, how exactly do you think that that would work? Obviously, like, it's difficult for them to identify um, where the person is when they're when they're doing online surveillance. And I, I see that it kind of is uh, the equivalent of someone from like Las Vegas Police Department coming to my home and uh, uh, in a different state and and uh, uh, performing a search. Um, so I'll just answer the, as to uh, if Klee is still a threat and then Klee I think and, and, and then uh, yeah I think right. Kurt Marshall and Eva can tackle the other stuff. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Um, so uh, the answer is yes definitely um, but what we've seen is the government become very reticent and nervous about discussing Kalia or discussing even uh, you know I'll jump back to the net, uh, online security bills or the cyber security bills. They've been very nervous because it's completely outlandish right for them to push such bills when we still don't know what's going on with the surveillance. We still don't know what's going on with how they use the 
these the FISA Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act and things like that. Um, so I would say it is still very much a threat, um, and it's something that you know we as a community, we as the FF. Are, have to keep our toes on because right the second we fall asleep or the second you know some we miss something th they may try and slip it in or they may try and continue to push it um, but for now I don't think for now at least for now though short term right next month or two right I don't think it is a threat but definitely medium to long term it's something that they've been very vocal about um, and it's something to watch for and you know I, I I really hope that we don't have to go through another crypto war. Um, yeah. And I, I just wanted to like, add, like, w in terms of like, uh, extending those abilities down to local law enforcement, um, the first time that that was discussed with their legal counsel in front of the subcommittee in, in Congress, the two examples they brought up were um, the importation of drugs and like, child pornography, which are not national security issues. Yeah. Well, um, to be clear uh, for everybody here, uh, Kalia does not at this time uh, include the ability to wiretap the internet. Uh, and uh, there's actually been a lot of, of questions about whether or not this includes uh, Skype, which is a voice over IP service and it is used by hundreds of millions of people all over the world. Um, until fairly recently, until a couple of years ago, uh, Skype was a European based company and therefore was not uh, even potentially um, coming under CALEA because it was out of CALEA's jurisdiction. But when Skype was purchased by Microsoft, suddenly there were questions about whether or not uh, Skype would be required to include sort of uh, backdoor wiretapping uh, capabilities in order to comply with law enforcement requests. Uh, in order to clarify this, uh, EFF was part of a coalition of uh, individuals and, and NGOs that uh, wrote a letter to Microsoft requesting a transparency report on Skype uh, saying, hey, if you could just clarify whether or not you're tapping hundreds of millions of users, uh, you know, voice over IP phone communications, we'd really appreciate that. So. Um, in a, in a very gratifying moment, uh, Microsoft did us one better. A few months later, they came out with a transparency report for all of their products, including Skype. And if you take a look at Microsoft's transparency report for Skype, it says we have never given up any, uh, you know, any phone calls, any content data, anything to uh, uh, to the governments in response to a request to any government. Then. <laughs> The Snowden revelations came around and we started looking at the prism slides, uh, which actually included Skype as a, uh, as a source of content. Uh, and a lot of the other uh, Snowden revelations have seriously implied uh, or outright stated that at one point or another the NSA has had the ability to tap Skype uh, communications. So I think that Microsoft and Skype have a great deal of explaining to do and it's really unclear uh, the extent to which the NSA is capable of eavesdropping on Skype. Type communications. Um, one of the things that does appear to be clear is that they're probably not doing it under the auspices of CALEA, uh, that they have a, a different legal justification for doing this. Um, but it could very well be happening and uh, we are very interested in learning uh, just uh, what the extent of that eavesdropping is and uh, whether or not Microsoft or Skype were really capable of telling us that it was going on. Uh, I just wanted to just briefly address your, your jurisdictional question. I mean, Kalia yeah. is mostly about requiring service providers to have tapability, like the ability for the law enforcement to be able to get uh, telecommunications that, that went over them. But uh, where where they're getting the authority to uh, to do the wiretap comes from uh, other sources. So that you have like the wiretap act. They might some kind of information would be obtained through a through a warrant that is uh, obtained through the wiretap act. Um, if they are going through um, the foreign intelligence surveillance court, there are processes there. Like the well, the I guess the jurisdictional question was sort of about um, their desire to sort of extend these real time surveillance uh, powers down to local law enforcement. Well, local law enforcement actually has wiretap. Powers. Right. If they go to a court and get a, get an appropriate court order, then local law enforcement can uh, uh, do tapping. Yeah, okay. Just not on the internet and right. uh, <laughs> not under Kalia. All right. Thank you. Also, free weave, and thank you for bringing that up. Thank you. So my question is, um, like, we all get to go home 
at the end of this and go back to our families. But the guy who started this whole conversation is locked in an airport terminal. He's out now? Okay, I haven't seen a newspaper in Vegas since I got here. <laughs> but how can we help him? How can I help him? How can we help him? Yeah, he, he's stuck in Russia where the food is notoriously bad. <laughs> So in, in terms of the, the news, I mean, I guess to make sure everybody caught it, yeah, yeah. the Russians granted him one year uh, asylum, uh, so he is no longer uh, in the uh, in the airport. Uh, we just applauded the Russians. <laughs> and you know, the, don't, don't be fooled. I mean, the Putin government is not not a wonderful government, and they're very authoritarian, and they've done some some terrible things, um, especially with the internet. And especially with the internet, yeah. Um, I mean, this, this is part of a global power play as between the United States and, and Russia, uh, and that just sort of happened how it happened to, to play out here. But one of the things I think is sort of very important about this is, you know, what we're trying to do, especially with some of the, the work that we're doing, uh, you know, with filing a new lawsuits, pushing forward with that, going to Congress, trying to get better legislation, is take advantage of what Snowden has put out there. That you know, he 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 put this information out there, uh, not not for himself, but for all of you, so people could find out what was going on and the uh, what we can do with it. So we have all this information, study it, figure it out, figure out what's going on, and see what we can do to stop illegal and unconstitutional surveillance. So on the topic of Snowden and uh, Weave and others, what are the federal definitions of whistleblowers? How does the government get around that in order to prosecute someone in a criminal or civil case? And what protections do we have? Um, so whistleblower law is primarily the whistleblower laws are designed to protect people who go to the government to whistleblow. <laughs> So what the government's position on this actually is like, oh yeah, you should have gone to your supervisor at the NSA and told them all about it. <laughs> and you know, they will take it up the appropriate channels. And, you know, um, and, and some people have tried to do this and, and have not gotten responses. I mean, there actually may be a lot of people who are part of the system who have gone through the existing whistleblowers, talked to the inspectors general, you know, talked to uh, uh, you know, appropriate people. And of course, we never found out about it because the people upstream just ended the, the inquiry. Um, so un unfortunately, the protections for, for whistleblowers who are whistleblowing to the press and to the public are not very robust in the laws because a lot of times the government is actually not that keen on, on things coming out that way. Uh, but there's actually a number of really good organizations that, that focus on whistleblowers, whistleblowers.org and the Government Accountability Project. Uh, focus and try and help people who are interested in, in blowing the whistle. So if you, know, if you know someone who has information and wants to blow the whistle on it, those are really good resources for them. And then on the topic of CFA, CFAA and uh, Booz Allen and other very interesting, curious government contractors. So when you would end up like breaking into something that is owned publicly, and that's clearly in violation of intended access, so does that mean that the people that would be working for the government to build stuff like that are actually committing felonies? And are they at risk to get prosecuted by that if, for example, they blow the whistle on something? It's like if you install a rootkit on a device and it's intended to go affect China, but you're still effectively jailbreaking the device to add different firmware. Let's see if I can try it. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure about your question, but let me see if I can rephrase it and see, or, or, or see if I un understand it. You're talking about somebody who is working for the government and in the course of their work for the government they uh, get access to a, a device or, or exceed authorized access? Is yeah. That, um, so if they are doing so lawfully, that is to say pursuant to a warrant that, that authorizes the, the access, that's one story. And if they're doing it unlawfully, which is to say because the, it is exceeding what, what they are allowed to do under uh, the Constitution, uh, it's a different story. And it would be illegal. And in some circumstances, you can prosecute government officials who exceed their, their authority. But the law is actually fairly friendly to uh, law enforcement officials 
who uh, over, overstep bounds and it sort of uh, it comes to whether you are exceeding a clearly established constitutional right. So if it's the first time that the courts are dealing with the question, there's a bit of a pass and there's a question of, of sort of whether it was intentional misuse. Um, it is fairly rare for a government official who exceeds their authority uh, in a manner that the government wanted them to do to get prosecuted. If somebody exceeds their authority in a manner that the government didn't want them to do, then absolutely they would, they're at risk of being prosecuted. Well, I'm thinking more in the terms of civilian contractors, people that aren't government officials but are still producing stuff that the government purchases. So. I mean, I think that there are um, less uh, uh, protections, but if they were doing it pursuant to a lawfully authorized warrant, then that, that should provide uh, protection. There's a lot of things in the law where it says good faith compliance with a lawfully authorized warrant can be protection. If somebody's not acting in good faith, if they're doing something which is if they knew that it was illegal, then there might be something that could go forward. But I think it's unlikely that Booz Allen will find itself uh, indicted or prosecuted yeah. for, for what it's done. I, I will also say that the CFAA has um, an exception Mm -hmm. uh, for any lawfully authorized investigative, protective, or intelligence activity of a law enforcement agency of the United States uh, or of any intelligence agency of the United States. And so, you know, particularly to the extent that a private contractor is doing work uh, on behalf of the government in that vein, mm -hmm. I think, you know, the, the statute pretty clearly wouldn't apply to them. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. First I wanted to say thanks. I appreciate everything the EFF is doing to protect our rights. We supposedly already have. <laughs> I wanted to continue in the vein of whistleblowers. How can, how can grassroots or legislative reform help to protect leakers and whistleblowers? Because I think you know, if, if you study history, you see that governments are always prone to abuse and to becoming oppressive at various points and we need leakers and whistleblowers like Snowden. So how can we, um, as an internet savvy community, um, make it, solve that bigger problem of, of protecting, like with the Pentagon Papers, you know, restoring some of those protections to leakers and whistleblowers? On the, on the legislative stuff, you want to, okay. I, in general, there are there are a couple of things out there. I mean, there's the sh uh, an attempt to get a very federal reporter shield law. Uh, now, this gets at the problem in a little bit of a of, of a different direction, which is to say it protects uh, journalists from having to disclose who their sources were so that if somebody goes in confidence to a journalist and says, you know, I've, here's uh, the, the evidence of uh, wrongdoing uh, and the government says, okay, who gave that to you? If there were a federal shield law, they would be able to say, I'm protected by the shield law. I don't have to disclose who my source is. Uh, a lot of states have shield laws. Um, some of them are very protective. Some of them are modestly protective. Uh, but there is no federal shield law. And then there's also the First Amendment uh, and its protections for freedom of speech and freedom of the press. And how that has shaken out in the courts is that uh, on the whole, you, there are protections for having reporters having to give up their sources, but they can be overcome by a sufficient showing of need uh, by the government. The government has tried to get this information from other sources and failed. Um, and so the other thing to do would be to use litigation, impact litigation in a court and try and uh, show a court uh, that the First Amendment does apply and to give uh, greater protections because, you know, uh, there, there's, a, there's a quote from one of the, the founders of this, this country that I'm going to probably badly paraphrase, uh, but a popular government without access to popular information is but a prelude to a farce or a tragedy or maybe both. And what it's meaning by that is that if we're going to have a democracy where people are voting about, you know, representatives and the representatives are voting about the laws, but we don't know what's really going on, where we don't have access to full information, then it just becomes a farce. That we're not able to have a functioning democracy without a good amount of information and without a good amount of transparency. 
And I just I'll wanted to add one quick thing. Uh, which is that uh, one of the reasons why EFF is made up of activists, technologists, and lawyers is that sometimes the answer is not litigation uh, or legislation. Sometimes the answer is technology. And one of the strongest protections that we can offer to whistleblowers is strong encryption. And if I could add at a most basic level, um, something that all of us can do is get in touch with our elected representatives and simply tell them that this is something that we consider important. Now this is an area where unfortunately for those of us who care about technology, phone calls are better than email and personal visits to a member's office are better still. But they listen and on some level the, that, that one constituent took the time to, to come in and tell them how important this issue is to them, they see that as representative of thousands of constituents. Uh, hi. Uh, regarding technology patent trolls, um, kind of a much less important issue than a lot of these civil liberty discussions, but uh, can you discuss the current situation with some specific patent trolls claiming ownership of the entire idea of podcasting and podcast protocols and where that kind of stands legally now, if any of you? Uh, I can't. Uh, I'll do that to the to the extent of my knowledge. I'm I'm actually not the st uh, staff patent expert. We have two of them, but this was a person who created a a pre-internet uh, uh, audio distribution company. Where the idea was I uh, had something to do with uh, sending Recording audio programs spoken. on cassette tape. Uh, <laughs> to subscribers in uh, uh, sort of a, so I guess sort of an early version of, the, of uh, Netflix mailing DVDs. Um, and this was in the uh, mid 90s uh, before there was podcasting. Um, my understanding is that there's, uh, uh, there, there may be some examples in patent law, this is known as prior art. This is evidence that uh, something was invented before the, the patent owner claims to have inv invented it. Uh, in other words, the, the, their invention was not in fact new. Uh, my understanding is there, there may be some prior art for podcasting uh, for the, the, the ideas that, he's, uh, that this uh, gentleman is claiming. Uh, and if that's so, then we may be able to get the uh, patent office to, to nullify that patent, uh, which would... Uh, uh, you know, probably end the lawsuits and the threats, and and that's what we're pursuing. You Thank you. Good luck with that. Yeah. The, well, there's trolling effects, which is which is uh, on the the particular thing, the podcasting patent. Um, there is a, a method we're trying to gather information about prior art uh, that's out there. Um, I don't remember the con. But basically, if you if you look through our blog post and see the one about this, it will give you how you can submit uh, prior art that you're aware of. Uh, basically, things from the uh, early to mid '90s would be particularly useful. It was like the the patent was issued slightly before the Internet Archive started gathering things, which has made it you know a little bit more difficult to look back at some of the history. But we still have uh, found some so far and, and gathering more. Uh, the other site that we maintain on that subject, and, and, and I think that it might be uh, of use, is called defendinnovation.org. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one is if you guys might be able to talk about um, a recent court ruling talking about local law enforcement not being required to have a warrant to track uh, cell phone location. Uh, that just recently came up. Um, and maybe the reasoning behind that. Um, uh, and then the second part, uh, the second question I've got is um, uh, anything on drones. Uh, you guys published a new list. Uh, I just hadn't heard anything about it. I was kind of surprised. So, um, all right. So uh, let, let me let me hit uh, the first of those questions about uh, cell phone uh, tracking. Um, and so, yeah, unfortunately, there there was a recent case that was saying that that uh, warrants were not necessary. It was a uh, appellate court decision, uh, two to. Out of three said that you didn't need a warrant, one, one uh, dissented. 
Uh, it has actually been a mixed bag out there in, in the courts. We've gotten some courts that have uh, agreed that a warrant is necessary um, to, to use cell phone tracking. And I think actually if you, if you uh, look at the recent Supreme Court case uh, from last year, U.S. v. Jones was talking about a GPS tracker um, being used to track someone. They said a warrant was required for, for that and I think that if that case is properly uh, extended to the cell phone space it should come to a, a similar conclusion that a warrant is, uh, is required. But yeah, unfortunately there was that, that decision. We are continuing to, to work on this and try and find uh, uh, cases that are going to uh, you know, be good opportunities to show that the Fourth Amendment applies to uh, cell phone information. Can I add? Please. So because I've been here and I've been crazy busy and this case just came out earlier this week, I haven't actually read the opinion yet. But what I understand from the reporting is that um, the rationale that the court adopted um, was based on the third party doctrine. And this is something that you guys all ought to know about and um, uh, really have on your radars. So the deal is um, the Fourth Amendment as a general matter, right, um, protects you against unreasonable government searches and seizures. And so the government is supposed to have a warrant um, to search something in which you have a reasonable expectation of privacy unless some exception applies, okay? That's the general rule. So back in the 70s, the Supreme Court decided a couple of cases, um, one involving bank records and one involving um, the, uh, the, the numbers uh, that a telephone company collects when you dial a call. And in those cases the Supreme Court basically said you don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy in information that you convey to a third party like that, like a company, right? Um, your bank records, uh, your financial information that you convey to a bank, and they, cre they create records from, and the numbers you dial that you convey to a phone company, you don't have any reasonable expectation of privacy and information like that. And the reason is because you know that you're giving it up. You know, you're voluntarily giving this information over to them. And so how can you have a reasonable expectation of privacy in that? And um, that has developed into this concept that we call the third party doctrine, um, which broadly um, seems to suggest that you don't have any reasonable expectation of privacy in anything that you give to a third party. In this day and age where we store so much information with companies like Google, Facebook, uh, Microsoft, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that's a very dangerous precedent. And that's something that we need to, we need to make go away. It just doesn't translate to the world we live in now. And in the, the case that, that Kurt spoke about, um, Supreme Court Justice uh, uh, Sotomayor just really called this out and said this is something that's, you know, we've got to look at. And so I think you're going to see a lot of cases in the future dealing with this and I think the Fifth Circuit from what I've read has really gone the wrong way on this because they basically said, well, these are cell phone records and they're stored with your company. So, um, and so that's, that's very problematic and I think you're going to hear a lot about this in the, in the coming years. Yeah. Um, and so uh, speaking of reasonable expectations of, of privacy uh, and, and the next question was about drones. So recently uh, the, the FBI uh, responded to I believe it was Senator Leahy who sent a letter explaining what the standard is for drones and they took the position that uh, you did not have a reasonable expectation of privacy uh, in, in, uh, against drones. That is to say that it was not reasonable to expect that you would be private from a drone circling over your house and, and taking pictures of what you're doing in your backyard. Uh, and they based that on some cases that they were involved like manned plane surveillance that, that had been done in the, in the course of the, of the drug war. Um, and this is sort of a little bit illustrative of how things have sort of been going in, in terms of government surveillance is they are looking for cases in which there have been uh, statements about what reasonable expectation of privacy is uh, that have stemmed from some particular circumstances and then seeing how far they can be applied. So they find a court that says that uh, at some point a plane flew somewhere and looked looked down and there was not a reasonable expectation of privacy on that, then that also means there could be a drone 24 or 7 hanging over your house. That like once they establish that there, there is a, a reasonable expectation of privacy, they can take it to the nth degree and it doesn't matter. And it really does matter. They, like, even though you, you, it, it's entirely possible that a police officer would follow you around where you go a, and you know, make handwritten notes about where you're going and what you're doing, um, 
this does not mean that it is a good society, a society, that, a future that we would want to live in where everybody's movements are tracked all of the time. And there was a... And so this has made this sort of the third party doctrine, the reasonable expectation of privacy is become outdated and it's becoming misused to take some things which be rare, occasional things where there was a natural uh, limit of resource based limit to how much the government can do it when things become cheaper, they can do it all the time and so we're very much working on trying to stop that. And just to sort of wrap up on drones, so the, the people on, on this panel right now are not our uh, drones uh, uh, experts, but one of them actually is here, our colleague Parker Higgins, uh, who is going to be in the contest area. He's working the CFAA phone booth, but if you have questions about drones, uh, he knows a lot about them. Uh, at the same time that the uh, NSA panop panopticon was being discussed, it also uh, seemed to be uh, apparent that the uh, government was going to top tier providers and asking them to give up their encryption keys. Uh, I don't think the subject has gotten to that to this extent yet, but what does that do to the concept of non repudiation and contract law or uh, even uh, chain of evidence, digital evidence? where um, our digital identities are now no longer uh, solely our own. Or, if, or to put it another way, if, if, the, if the whole uh, um, uh, if the uh, <laughs> Right, so I mean, the, the, the question is raising the, the sort of the possibility that um, as you may be uh, communicating in, a, in what you believe to be an encrypted uh, channel, that nevertheless someone might be forced to to give up the key such that your communications uh, could be decrypted and that you wouldn't have the level of security that you are you are right, coming or to. What the phrase I was looking for: if you backdoor key escrow. Uh, does my, my digital identity, my uniqueness and non-repudiation suddenly evaporate and, and become negligible as a, as a point of law? Hmm. Well, I, I've not thought of it in terms of the, of the digital identity because usually where, where, what we've been hearing about is more on the sort of a encrypting communications on a channel not as, as, as a as encryption method, not as a digital signature method. Um, but nevertheless, it is, it is quite troubling. Um, that we, you know, we have a number of, of systems that, that are designed to be able to encrypt communications using a, a public key infrastructure and certificate authorities and um, these systems have a, have a lot of problems and I think what, what Dan was talking about earlier is some of our attempts to, to try and at least understand and investigate those problems. Ooh, I guess we can put it this way. I mean, the more that is known and revealed about uh, government access to encryption keys, the more likely it is that a good lawyer in a contract dispute uh, or anything involving chain of digital evidence uh, will be able to convince a jury that, that the, the contract uh, was forged or that the, the evidence was manufactured. So that's, that risk will increase. Thank and you. Just to quickly add one last point to that. I think that it's a, a really good question. I, I understand you as saying uh, providers having to give over their private encryption keys to, to law enforcement. And I think that this is, there's kind of a hole right now in terms of uh, uh, statutes about this. So law tends to focus on user data, but there's a big question mark about, well, yeah, you can get user data if you have these keys and are, you, are companies forced to hand over the keys under various warrant or subpoena circumstances? And I think there's just a, a lot of unclarity about that right now and it's something that is really alarming. I, I also want to add just one sort of gen general point on, on this is that, you know, companies may be required to provide some technical assistance to the government when they, when they want to wiretap. But there's also a notion that they shouldn't uh, be required to break their services. Um, and I think, I think it's, if your service is, is involves providing encrypted communications and you're not actually providing it, that may break the service and that may be uh, an available uh, argument. Thank you. Hi. So um, since this uh, Snowden revelation, I've been trying to think about um, the, there's three different contexts for data retention. So there's this NSA program that we just learned about. And then there is the data retention that my service provider is already doing of my metadata of their own volition. And then there's 
Um, and this is in the United States. And then there's internationally how data retention works. And my understanding is that in Europe it's, it's more regulated than it is here. Uh, and so I wanted to ask if, if you would mind sort of characterizing the difference between those three contexts in terms of, you know, how long my data is retained and, um, you know, how it's exposed to access uh, uh, by the government uh, with an eye to what you think the right answers are. Uh, so I can talk a little bit, um, and if, if you wanted to add. Uh, so Europe, I understand, is kind of a mixed bag because there, are, there is greater protection um, in terms of user data and how it's handled. But on the other hand, there are also mandatory data retention laws, which we do not have in the United States. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. Um, but beyond those mandatory data retention laws, I think, as I said earlier, it's kind of the wild west in the private sector. So it's just sort of up to the company how long they want to retain your data. And they can have privacy policies right now which, you know, disclose that. And if they break those privacy policies, they're opening themselves up to, to FTC complaints or, or possible uh, other lawsuits, class action lawsuits and this sort of thing. But basically there's, there's no information um, in terms of, or th there's no limit to what data they can, sh can retain. Um, on that front, I think the right answer is a lot of transparency from companies and also ensuring that we don't pass a mandatory data retention law. So if, if a VPN doesn't want to keep data, they shouldn't have to. Um, so I think those, that's the way that we should be going for the, the private sector. With respect to government um, data, I don't know if someone else wants to, to take that, but I also think that there's, there's no clear rules about it. I, I think there's one more important point to make about, uh, about the private sector in the United States, especially in Silicon Valley where you have a lot of startups and uh, people are sitting on a lot of user data. There is a tendency among engineers to want to save everything because you never know when it's going to be useful. <laughs> yeah. In fact, your company might go completely under and then that might be the only thing that you can sell. So uh, there's a, a very strong push to retain as much data as possible for as long as possible. Uh, saving data is cheap. Backups are cheap. The consequences of not having the data when you need it are dire and deletion is computationally expensive. So usually when, you know, sort of Silicon Valley companies have a choice between uh, storing everything indefinitely and finding some way to regularly delete it, they will choose to just store it all indefinitely because it's easier. It's not a conspiracy against user data. It's not a conspiracy to make things more convenient for the government. It's the, if, if you've ever walked into an engineer's office and seen piles of paper and noticed that they never throw anything away, this is just sort of an outgrowth of that. And um, in some ways that is uh, potentially very, very worrying because even if you don't have mandatory data retention this, in this manner, sometimes you wind up having de facto data retention. Uh, and so uh, to, to address the, uh, the government uh, storing at end of it, I mean the, the question is are they supposed to have it in the first place? And the, uh, the problem with some of these sort of mass storage um, uh, things that were, have been confirmed recently with uh, uh, reports about the NSA getting just, you know, gigantic piles of storage. Five years, that's what they say they're doing, except actually if your information is encrypted, then it's until it's decrypted. So uh, it, they'll, they'll keep it around uh, for forever um, or at least until they figure out how to decrypt it. So. The problem is really that they get it in the first place. Uh, that, that they should only be able to get the information when they, uh, they meet legal standards uh, and then only keep it so long as it is needed for that, for that valid purpose. Um, if that helps answer the question. Uh, with regards to um, the development of U.S. cyber warfare, I guess you could say architecture maybe. I don't really know if that's the correct word. But it seems like that uh, our government has been penetrated multiple times by, you know, groups like LOLSEC. While at the same time we've developed, you know, advanced cyber weapons like Stuxnet and now regularly are tapping into other countries. Could you speculate on that? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> I can't speculate on that. Well, we don't have to. We actually don't 
We don't have to speculate because uh, the White House released this thing called the uh, a presidential policy directive and it's a document that the president creates that instructs the divisions and the cabinet agencies about what the ex policy is for the administration. And so the document uh, actually as part of uh, the Snowden leaks, what came out was this, it was a classified presidential policy directive. It was the presidential policy directive number 20. Um, and what it did was it kind of confirmed what a lot of uh, academics and people who, and security researchers, people were watching where the government is going with uh, kind of this online warfare and virus making, malware making. Um, and what it did is it revealed that they have pretty much routinized uh, the processes and are beginning to study and look into and create working groups for how the government is going to deal with this and what the government is going to do. Before, the docu before this document we saw very vague outlines, right, like uh, the U.S. government will follow the, the laws of war um, and the U.S. government would follow, we will follow uh, um, the U.N. conventions and international law. Uh, what this document revealed was it kind of got into much greater detail on what the government is doing, um, how they will act in defense if they, if they suppose any sort of exfiltration of data or if they suppose they're under any, any type of attack. Um, and the document provided a pretty good foundation uh, for how they, how they justify um, Stuxnet. And we also know now within the past couple of weeks, right, that um, uh, one of the generals is being investigated over leaking uh, the fact that Stuxnet was a U.S. Israeli project. And so, you know, we, uh, what we're seeing right now and what uh, we're, uh, paying much attention to and fighting against is this increased militarization of the internet. Um, it was something that was always kind of in the backgrounds. It was something that we were always hesitant and watching and, and thought was happening. But what we're seeing now is that yes, it's happening. Um, the government is creating these things. And there's hardly anything to be, to be regulating it or figuring out how to stop it and what to do about it because um, we don't know what they're doing. Um, and so what I think is going to happen and what, you know, especially part of the transparency efforts we're fighting for is to talk with the government and issue kind of these policy papers and what we think, uh, you know, should happen in this area and what we think really shouldn't happen with the increased militarization of the internet because especially the stuff that, you know, Flame is another good example. Uh, when you use an malware when using online virus, it is very different because you're no longer, you can try as hard as you may to target a, a foreign nation state or uh, something you want to exfiltrate from a government. Um, but it's hopping the network, right? And it's hopping the network into the public sphere and it's causing citizens and it's causing individuals who are not associated with the government and who aren't supposed to be your targets. Um, and it's something that's very dangerous that's happening. Um, I just wanted to interrupt for a second uh, rudely and talk a little bit about the rhetoric of cyber warfare. Uh, one of the uh, very interesting things that, uh, that came out of the presidential directive was this sort of declaration that cyberspace had been uh, sort of declared to be a theater of war. And I think that uh, one of the biggest problems when it comes to talking about this stuff with the U.S. government is that there is an entire culture of people who say cyber. And which is generally a good sign that you're talking to someone who has very little in common with the Electronic Frontier Foundation. <laughs> and uh, the biggest problem with the term cyber warfare is that packets are not bullets. And as a general rule, they do not kill people. And once you start using the rhetoric of warfare and guns and bullets and cyber bombs and cyber shields and cyber tanks or whatever it is they are using. Cyber Pearl Harbor. I'd really like to know what the hell this Cyber Pearl Harbor is that we've been promised for so many years. Uh, so yeah, once you start using this kind of rhetoric, it leads you to all kinds of very erroneous uh, conclusions about what kind of uh, protections we need and what the U.S. can do and what the U.S. is justified in doing in protecting, uh, you know, sort of the 
uh, American internet um, in as much as there is an American internet. Uh, so I'm generally very wary of, uh, of the term cyber warfare and anything that begins with cyber and the entire war um, rhetoric because I think it really frames the problem in a highly misleading way. Yeah, I'll, suppose, oh, I'll just add it's also seriously blurring the distinction between uh, um, civilian and military uh, when it comes to the internet. Yeah, a, a lot of the um, a lot of a lot of the things that we've been reading about, you know, sort of proposed protections for uh, for the U.S. and uh, for U.S. cyberspace, uh, have to do with protecting uh, U.S. companies' trade secrets. And uh, honestly, as far as I can tell, that's not a valid military objective. You know who protects companies' trade secrets? Companies who have, hopefully, many people employed to protect the, the, their own security. This should not be uh, something that American uh, tax dollars pay for, and this should not be something that the U.S. military does. My question is regarding uh, the um, uh, EFS thoughts about uh, the preemptive uh, web filtering that's happening in the UK. Um, it was originally slated as being for pornography blocking but has since revealed to be uh, spread to other uh, subject matter. Um, and what, if any, actions are being taken um, in regards to that? <sighs> oh, British Internet, we can't take you anywhere. Uh, what's particularly interesting about the UK uh, pornography filters uh, is, uh, to begin with, these are not mandatory filters in any way. But what's happening is that every uh, every household in in the UK uh, will have porn filtering uh, turned on by default by uh, the major U uh, ISP in the UK. And if you want porn you have to make an affirmative decision to contact your ISP and ask for porn. <laughs> and they really don't see what the possible chilling effect of such a thing might be. And really the chilling effect shouldn't matter because children. <laughs> Needless to say this is a terrible idea. Uh, EFF frequently comes out uh, against uh, against porn filtering. We think that porn filtering is fine if you decide to put it on your computer, on your network. Um, but uh, having this sort of tyranny of defaults in which you have to make a, uh, a rather public uh, disclosure to someone else that you want porn is, uh, is highly, highly problematic and poses a potential chilling effect. Not to mention that it looks like the filters are blocking things other than just porn. Uh, and that this really gives the, the power to censor the internet uh, to these ISPs and to the people who are building the blacklists. And we think that blacklists in general are a very terrible idea. They don't work and they block all the wrong stuff. So uh, I'm actually from the UK. And, awesome. uh, <laughs> I am really Would you like porn? <laughs> So I am really looking forward to moving back into my parents' new house and finding one of two situations. Either the porn filter is off and I'm hung out to dry, or the, uh, sorry, the porn filter is on and I'm hung out to dry, or the porn filter is off and I know something about my dad that I didn't need to know. <laughs> to or be fair, mom. you may also know something about your mom. Yeah, sorry. My bad. Uh, she can't really use computers though. Um, <laughs> so, uh, secondly, I just wanted to um, sort of add to your point about data retention. Um, you said that um, uh, with a lot of these startup companies, um, uh, you know, data can be, if the company goes under, the only thing they have left. Um, I would actually, I'd add to that, I would say that data is the only commodity they have in the first place and the best way to make sure it doesn't get into the wrong hands is just not to give it to them. Um, uh, my real question was about prison. Um, so, being from Europe, um, you guys actually have nothing to worry about as American citizens because um, prison doesn't actually target you guys. If what the NSA is, if, if what the NSA says is to be believed, um, if they believe that you have a 51 percent chance of being foreign, right? Uh, then, uh, then you are a legitimate target. So, uh, as a foreigner. Um, this is this more than fifty-one percent. <laughs> yeah, this is this is really strange um, because uh, you know 
a, a billion, more than a billion people around the world using Facebook. Um, you know, the U.S. has effectively almost, I mean, I hate to use this word, but um, because like you say, it's kind of inappropriate, but they have kind of declared war on the world by, you know, having all of this data stored in the private companies within your borders and, uh, and yet you have access to all of it. So what can we from, uh, well, firstly, is the European governments doing anything? Do they have a leg to stand on at all? And uh, is there anything we can do to support them? Well, um, let me talk about PRISM real quick. Uh, the, a lot of the time when American NGOs and civil liberties organizations talk about PRISM, it's very focused on outrage over the NSA spying on Americans. And the reason why this outrage is so focused is because spying on Americans is very clearly outside of what the NSA was uh, originally entitled to do. It is outside of its purpose. And so it is very, very clearly illegal. Now, what about the rest of the world? Um, a lot of these NGOs will simply leave the rest of the world out to dry. They'll say the NSA exists to spy on the rest of the world and we can't get all upset when it runs around spying on non-US persons. And on this particular point, I disagree. Um, just because you are a non-US person doesn't mean that you suddenly don't have rights. Uh, and not just, you know, you know, it's not like the Bill of Rights and the U.S. Constitution and U.S. law are the only law on earth. Um, and in fact, it seems very likely that uh, the NSA's uh, wiretapping has, or the NSA's sort of uh, dragnet surveillance uh, does infringe on the privacy rights of, uh, of hundreds of millions of internet users all over the world. The problem is that it's very unlikely that we're going to get any kind of, uh, of legal recourse for it. There, there's simply nowhere for, for us to go to appeal having our you know, basic human rights uh, violated as non-US persons. Um, what we can do <laughs> is use strong encryption. Uh, and also there has been a great deal of talk within uh, within governmental bodies all over the world looking into the state of, uh, of NSA surveillance. There uh, was a, a bill proposed, well, I think a bill actually made it to the floor earlier this week in Mexico. There have been a number of proposals in the EU. People are really quite riled up about this and uh, it's possible that we will see some legislation in other parts of the world, especially because uh, one of the key parts of the NSA, uh, of the revelations that we've seen um, about NSA spying is that we're not just run around, running around spying on uh, non-U.S. Non persons who are a threat to the U.S. We're also spying on our allies. And uh, needless to say uh, that this makes uh, our allies, uh, including the Five Eyes, including the U.K., uh, somewhat outraged. So the question line is our... Sir? Am I good to go? Sorry. <laughs> yeah. We're just going to keep it in order here, I'm, and sometimes we may have to return to a follow-up question, but I think people who have been waiting uh, should get the Just didn't want to ruin a good thing. But um, in terms of the privacy movement, I kind of have a two-part question. Um, I think in information security, we're very aware of all the implica uh, implications, or however you say it, of what can happen with all this data. But how do you get someone that just goes on Facebook and looks at pictures of cats all day to really understand what this means? And what is the next step for the privacy movement, like Project MeshNet or something? What should we be working on in the meantime? Okay. All right. Um, I guess uh, before we get to the, to the legal aspects of this, which Kurt will address uh, shortly, um, I, I think that it's a, it's a misnomer. Uh, it's a misunderstanding to say that people, uh, people these days either don't understand the privacy that they're giving up um, or don't care about the privacy that they're giving up when they use uh, social networks like Facebook. And I can say this because I talk to people all over the world all the time uh, about their concerns about this very issue. Um, if you want to see somebody who has a, a deep and intrinsic understanding of every single one of Facebook's privacy protections and how they work, uh, look at a teenager whose parents have just friended them on Facebook. <laughs> 
they know how that stuff works backwards and forwards and they keep up with every last update because they are very interested in making sure that they maintain their privacy from people who, well, really shouldn't know that they're, what they're doing out on a Saturday night. Um, and I think that this is also true for other people who have, uh, you know, who have things to lose by losing their privacy. Uh, people are very aware. They're smarter than we give them credit for. And really the, the task that we have as, uh, as privacy trainers is just to give them the right tools uh, to use in order to, uh, in order to protect themselves and also to uh, help them understand their threat model, help them understand what information it is that they're trying to protect and who they're trying to protect it from. And if you give users that information, they can usually make smart decisions about, uh, about what to do with their privacy. Well, I just want to add on to that. Like, how do we make them care considering the, I'm sorry, the NSA thing, the yeah. spying, right? How do we make them really care considering in other countries they protested the spying but we realistically didn't do as much of – like put forth an effort as much? So I'm going to address this – we only have a few minutes remaining in the session so I'm going to try and address this, this briefly and I think actually we also have to cut off the, the, the question line. Um, but one of the things that I think has helped uh, resonate this issue when I've talked to people about it is talking about privacy in terms of control of, of your information. To get away from the whether, it, whether it's something that you have to hide in particular, but don't you want to have it so your information only goes to the people that you want it to go to and not to the ones that you don't, that you have a sense of autonomy and control and where your information goes and what the, the spying is doing is taking away that autonomy and giving control away to somebody else. So I, I found that has been helpful. Um, I would also, sorry, just add that I think people, just to reiterate what Eva said, but add on that at least I don't know how, how, uh, how much people trust polls, but there's been a slew of polls within the past few weeks re that have been released that, um, you know, by Pew, Gallup, uh, Washington Post, and a few others that it really shows a clear uh, change in people's attitudes, the large American public's uh, attitudes towards the government privacy and towards the NSA spying in particular. And so, you know, I think the job is to continue to hammer home what we've been saying, what we've been talking about, you know, uh, talking about the lawsuits and, you know, what, what exactly is metadata and things like that because at least, you know, from these recent polls, we're seeing, I, I think we're seeing for the first time, you know, since maybe 9-11 where the larger public shift towards privacy and shift towards kind of this government surveillance regime is changing. Uh, there's an active ongoing petition on the whitehouse.gov website to pardon Edward Snowden, last time I checked, it had 132,000 signatures. Is that just an empty gesture? Is that a, a valuable tool or, or, or does, does that come up with a free IRS audit for all the signatories of the, <laughs> the, the well, petition? Um, uh, I, 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 yeah. I just wanted to know about uh, what, if anything, the government has to do in, to respond to that petition. Well, I just want to take the chance to talk about the White House petitioning system because um, yeah. it's something that I don't think a lot of people uh, know about. The, but the the We the People site, the White we House. We have one minute remaining, so. Oh, sorry. The White House petitioning site is a <laughs> massive emailing list for Barack Obama's campaign. So you give them your information and they harvest all your data uh, is my quick 10 seconds. So you should always watch out when you sign those petitions because it's essentially a campaign tool for the president's uh, uh, political operation. All right, so we have like one minute remaining, so I guess one more question and then uh, for the, uh, thanks for being in line. We'll, we can talk to you afterwards, but we're, we're going to have to move. So, sir. Yeah, uh, question and a comment. Uh, so, Congressman Rick Holt of New Jersey has introduced uh, legislation to roll back the surveillance state, which asks for um, repealing the Patriot Act, repealing uh, FISA Amendments Act. Uh, not having a uh, requirement to have backdoors in uh, telecommunication equipment, and then one more item. What do you see as the prospects for that bill? Uh, well, Representative Holt's bill is one of the strongest bills presented in Congress thus far. Um, the only uh, uh, kind of nuance with the bill is that the, it completely obliterates, the government uh, 
has some sort of need for a grand jury subpoena to get some sort of information, and so Representative Holt's bill doesn't have that in it because um, there should be a process by which that happens, but it's the strongest bill thus far, and it's just another indication that Congress is going to tackle this issue and they're go and you know, knock on wood, I think they're going to fix the problem. Very quick comment because it's relevant to this. He's standing for election for the U.S. Senate in the in the special election in New Jersey uh, in the Democratic primary, which is on August 13th. And if okay. people want to we support have, him, so we're actually we're out of time. Yeah. Um, so but thank you all for coming. It's so wonderful to see you here. And thank you again. Great to be here. Such an interesting day.